Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to this webinar. Um, on behalf of the Biochemical Society and Portland Press, I'm very pleased to welcome you to today's webinar, which is part of our biochemistry focus webinar series. Um, topics in this series include different research areas in the molecular biosciences, as well as practical sessions to support career development. Each webinar will give you the opportunity to ask questions via the text function, and we welcome suggestions as well for future topics and speakers to feature in our uh, future webinars. So if you have any ideas uh, for future webinars you'd like us to run, please have a look at our website. Um, it's given at the bottom of that slide. Uh, my name's Helen Watson. Um, I'm Associate Professor of Bioscience Education at the University of Plymouth, and I also chair the Biochemical Society's Education Committee. So in today's webinar, we're going to hear from the, our Biochemical Society 2022 Teaching Excellence Award, uh, Dr. Dave Lewis, uh, Dave from the University of Leeds in the UK. So Dave Lewis is a senior lecturer in pharmacology and bioethics in the School of Biomedical Sciences at the University of Leeds, where he creates and delivers innovative educational activities designed to promote personal and professional development, and also to prepare students for the diversity of careers they go on to. He's created a sector-leading portfolio of capstone projects for his students, and has led the implementation of capstone projects as alternative to traditional final honours year research projects across the UK. Dave's also uh, delivered professional education activities for individuals in India, China and across Africa who are involved in the care and use of animals for research. And at the moment, Dave is currently taking a leading role in his school's plans for Curriculum Redefined, which is a huge 10 year programme of curriculum change across the University of Leeds. So welcome, Dave. Um, we do have the opportunity, we've got a few minutes at the end to ask Dave questions about his presentation. Um, you can send in questions at any point during the talk. Um, if you do have a question, please type it in the question box as shown the image on the slide now. Um, and you can put them in at any point and we'll at the end we'll try and answer as, as many questions as we, as we have time for. Um, so over to you then, Dave. Thank you, Alan. Okay, so see the switch screen, Helen. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Okay, so thank you, Helen, for that kind introduction, and thank you to the society uh, for for this award. I'd also like to thank Joe, Kenny, and Robbie for nominating me, and all the the colleagues and students across the world who are, who I've worked with. It's really been a sort of a collaborative uh, effort. So today, then. Uh, applying lessons learned from a pandemic educational environment, how can we better prepare our students for the diversity of careers that they go on to? So as Joe said, I started off here at Leeds as a, a pharmacology student, uh, moved to Birmingham to do my PhD and really got involved in the early stage of my PhD in teaching um, you know, tutorials rather than just demonstrating practicals and really developed as an educator since then and again returning back to Leeds. So my whole uh, educational ethos or direction is student personal and professional development and interventions that prepare them for the workplace. So really focusing on four things, capstones, ethics and ethical awareness and cultural awareness, sorry, research animal sciences and more recently curriculum design and development. So thinking about this, this post pandemic education environment, the new all, we've got really two options. Do we turn to our old ways or do we see it as a once an educator's career transformative opportunity that we'll be able to better prepare students for or to transition into the 21st century workplace in conditions where we've got changing st stakeholder expectations, we have a challenging and highly competitive global higher education marketplace, we have digital investments and uh, universities made significant digital investments during the uh, the pandemic and obviously want to realize those and uh, in changing strategic institutional strategic objectives so even before uh, COVID institutions like my own were moving towards a digitally enabled environment and since the COVID significant number of institutions are going through substantial curriculum change as a result of this, this new educational environment so during COVID, there were some things we did really well and some other things that not so well. 
So it did enable us to experiment, to try things that we didn't really dare to do before or weren't allowed. We did give students greater ownership and responsibility for their learning. And there was a huge collaboration, collegiality between educators of sharing resources, tools, et cetera, to support each other. And just some examples here. So Lecture Remotely, the website developed by Joe, TJ and Beth from DMU. And within that, the, you know, the Dry Lab Science uh, Initiative from Nigel, David and Ian, my own work on capstones and the Forensic Sci Initiative. So again, you know, it's just some of them. And really going forward, I think we really need to maintain that, that collegiality and cl cl collaboration. In hindsight, things we didn't do so well, so it was, we were able to react to the situation, so we're, we weren't really designing interventions. We didn't always use the most appropriate tools or approaches, what was available. It did massively enhance social inequalities to learning, particularly access to resources and education environments. We were unable to create things uh, with our students and we weren't didn't evaluate anything. So we can't really learn from that experience. I have limited opportunity to learn from that experience going forward. Also learning expectations have changed. They want the full, having sort of spent three years really learning in the bedrooms, they now want the full university experience, not only uh, on campus, but all the associated things that go with it, including a sense of belonging, need to prepare them, better prepare them for the workplace. So really re-engage the majority with the joy of learning. Crossing of fortune, so there's you know more of a consumer uh, orientated mentality, so a value for money and access to, to resources to us 24 seven. They were put off by, by the Zoom lecture. So really, you know, um, a move to on campus, but sort of, really sort of talking about if we are using digitally uh, digital resources so digitally enabled to support on-campus activities not really resorting back to, to, to the, the the zoom lecture and we gave them flexibility of learning so the time the day the place etc where they learned along with that came the ownership of, and responsibility for learning experience and again that you know they would like us to retain that flexibility Think about how we go forward. There's a great quote from Steve Jobs, the CEO of um, Apple at a Apple development conference. You've got to start with a customer experience and then work backwards for the technology. So if we think about the HE customer or learner experience, when they come into us, they really sort of, like the, this is Bloom's taxonomy of learning. They're really sort of remembering facts, regurgitating facts and understanding. By the time they leave us, we've got to be at the top of the, this higher level of learning. So be able to take information, understand it, apply it, analyze it, evaluate, create new knowledge and, uh, and understanding. Think about employers, you know, with the wealth of information that's easily available, that employers are less concerned about discipline specific knowledge. They're wanting more the ability to discover this knowledge, evaluate it, uh, apply the knowledge, et cetera. Critical thinking, problem solving. QAA benchmarks are changing. So the first batch we released this year, the next batch, including the biosciences is going to be March, 2023. And really the things that are coming through are workplace learning and tasks, uh, enterprise and uh, entrepreneurship, and um, equality, diversity, and uh, inclusion in education. BSRBs, professional statutory and regulatory bodies are, are responding to that. So if we think about society of biology and the last uh, change of the accreditation criteria, capstones came in and also a requirement for creativity. So problem solving, et cetera. Now there is a tension across the sector between discipline specific knowledge and this focus on employability. And I think really we should be aiming for both. This is a tweet from Ben Kitchy, who was the first, who led the design team to put uh, the Mars lander uh, on Mars. So I got a 2.4 GPA for my first semester in college. Thought maybe I wasn't cut out for engineering. Today I've landed two spacecraft on Mars. I'm now designing one for the moon. STEM is hard for everyone. 
Grades ultimately aren't what matter, it's curiosity and perseverance. So we've got to think about all our students, all abilities, support them, engage them with the subject, not only develop discipline specific knowledge, but also curiosity, perseverance, critical thinking, all these other skills that go with it. So if we think about the 20, you know, our incoming learners, the 2023 learner, and this really builds up on, on the work of the late Harriet Jones from UEA and Michelle Morgan more recently at uh, University of East London. So if we think about uh, the learner experiences to date, they didn't sit their GCSEs, they had teacher awarded grades, their A-levels, 18 months of which were uh, disrupted. This was the, probably the first exams they've ever sat. Think about them as digital natives, but if you look at the, the, the way their education is being delivered, they have virtually no experience of some of the common digital tools, Word, Excel, um, PowerPoint, etc. Their education, they might use uh, digital tools to, to you know, for, for resources, etc. But an awful lot of stuff is uh, printed out. Assessments are hard, cop are hard copies, etc. Think about you know your own children. They really are the YouTube generation. You know, a two or three minute YouTube video uh, all the time. If we look at their assessments, they're taught the test. So it's, you know, particularly in biology, it's very much keywords and not content. Their assessment is purely marked on keywords and it's very much micro assessments, you know, a two or six or eight mark question. I talk to my own son who's 17, he's written one essay in his entire educational uh, experience. With sort of school shutdowns, etc., they have limited practical skills of experience. The UK university system, or sorry, education system, is designed to stifle creativity. So the creative in nursery school and primary, when they go into uh, high schools, secondary schools, we stifle that. Limited resilience, and really sort of, particularly the last eight, you know, three years have really sort of exaggerated dis the disparities between the underrepresented group, represented groups. So really, Going forward, I think we should really give students, learners ownership and responsibility for their education experience and learning. So really, this is the, you know the work of Mick Healy. So when they come in, it's very much you know teacher focused, students as audience, with the emphasis on research content, so research led. And by the end, of, when they leave us after three or four years, it should be research based, so students participants, you know, they are you know undertaking inquiry based learning. The emphasis is on research processes and problems. And really having partnership learning communities across all our activities, partnerships between fellow learners, partnership between educators, learners, partnerships between educators and fellow educators. So really emphasize the shift between the way they were taught in schools versus the university. And again, a progressive development of autonomous learning. So facilitated learning in level four, semi-autonomous in level five and autonomous or independent learning in level six. Think about education in, in the dark ages, the middle ages, very much you know a didactic lecture from your you know the, the professor on high speaking to an audience, you might get the front row engaging, potentially taking notes, this one here, we're not quite sure what he's listening, but is, he, is it taken in? And as we go further back into the sides, we're getting less and less disengage, you know, less and less engagement. Giving a didactic lecture by PowerPoint. Those have probably been exaggerated if we think about uh, Zoom lectures or lectures delivered uh, digitally. Um, the human concentration span is 22 minutes. If you think about adding on to that cognitive load of looking at a small screen, possibly having to take notes at the same time, um, then our, the attention span is probably going to go down. Look at um, the optician's requirements for looking at screens. It's 20 minutes at a screen, 20 seconds away, looking at something 20 meters you know, distance. They're not going to engage with that full period of time. So this was a study of uh, in graduate medical education that if you 
looked at student engagement to a, a digital lecture. If they'd gone past the first minute, by 10 minutes they'd you know stopped engaging, or 28% had stopped engaging. You'd, you know, and then an exponential decline after that. So really, if we're providing content digitally, we should be aiming for you know 10, 15 minutes at most. If you look at the ed techs, they you know their podcasts are between five and seven minutes uh, at most for for a good reason. We also have to think about multitasking. You know, you know how many Zoom lectures or meetings have we been in where we're multitasking at the same time? But also the approachability of digital tools. You know, they could be looking at a small screen. They could be looking at a laptop. If we're then asking them to do, you know, quizzes, um, slide things, etc., on top of that, are they having to look at a, a second device to enable them to do that? So, mimic, you know, sort of not overdoing our expectations of, of technology. So, the way we delivered it in my own school, um, our education during COVID was a student-centered active and distributed learning model so student-centered meant it was totally focused on the student active so they were engaged they had to do things and distributed so different modes of learning individual um, team-based synchronous asynchronous etc and this model was sort of designed in partnership uh, with charlotte haig my director of student education so we Content was given in blocks of bite-sized blocks, so 10-minute podcasts. They then worked in teams to apply that content to a problem-based learning activity. They probably had to discover additional content to go along. There was discussion forums to support them. And then it ended in a plenary lecture that brought everything together. So we, this model was based on giving students ownership and responsibility for their learning social constructivism so that we learn better in teams rather individually and going forward we have a university push for digitally enabled uh, education and this is the model that we'll be we'll be using going forward we can adapt it and use some of the other suggestions so one of these from simon thompson in liverpool was the watch and chat where you timetable uh, these content sessions they don't have to watch in the time sale session but if they do there's an opportunity to chat online to other college students who are also watching at the same time or think about alternative learning spaces so walk and talk for example and just one example of that in practice so this is charlotte's module for level four physiology um, so screencasts of content released each week on the different uh, body systems and then a group activity every three or four weeks and then a plenary lecture which sort of uh, didn't go further but just sort of discussed uh, that content so does student-centered active and distributed learning approaches work this is a quote from Zosh, who's an educational psychologist that says it all humans learn best when they're active not passive engaged not distracted when material to be learned is meaningful not disjointed and when it occurs in a socially interactive context is iterative not merely repetitive and fun so the key words here are active engaged meaningful socially interactive and fun and i think the approach that we chose brought all those things uh, into play but things as i said earlier we didn't really evaluate it and most educational research is really only applicable to you know a single intervention a single institution etc it's small scale and underpowered what Ellie Theobald, and Ellie is a biologist from the University of Washington did, was to undertake a systematic review and meta-analysis of all the studies that looked at active learning to see really, if we looked across these studies, did it work or didn't it work? And this is, is Ellie's data here. So look at this, this is data for uh, underrepresented groups and showed that uh, active learning increased the, or decreased the exam score gap uh, for compared to passive learning for these underrepresented groups. And you can play the same sort of evidence would, would fit for uh, mainstream students as well. The more you did it, the or more you used active learning approaches, the greater the decrease in, in score gap. And so high intensity really was having to do active learning approaches about 80% of the time. 
if we look at this forest plot um, of the different types of interventions, clickers, flip classrooms, pub based learning, etc., this is the line of zero effect. Anything this way means you know it's, it's a, has a, a, you know, an effect, and the further away from the line of zero effect, the greater effect. We can see that all of them have uh, an effect, and you know to differing extents. So really, going forward, we should be using a combination of these different approaches. You know, the one is best suited for the type of uh, content that we are, uh, you know, attaching to it. So the key learning from this is that these student-centered, active, and distributed learning approaches work. They promote learning and attainment. If we are going forward with this, we have to design with learn with online in mind. We can't just digitize, you know, previous lectures. We have to think about putting team building activities at the front and then retain students in those teams as we go through. Limiting duration of digital content, to, as I said, usually under 10 minutes and thinking about not overusing digital tools if we're expecting to engage on you know, small, small devices. The other issue we've had to address and that massively cut while we were um, online was addressing content creep and overload. As we've developed our curricula over the years, we've, um, uh, as, you know, as new scientific discoveries, we put more and more content in, we've very rarely taken stuff out. So if I think about what was in my pharmacology degree, um, you know, X number of years ago compared to what's in there now, massive amount of change. You know, in, in those days, you know, we hadn't synthesized the human genome, the omics hadn't even been heard of. So the way my school has decided we're going forward is to use a concept rather than content driven curricula. So core concepts are big ideas that are enduring, difficult, applicable about contexts and useful to solve problems. So the idea really started off in physics, it moved to biology, and then now most of the life sciences uh, disciplines have core concepts for their discipline. So there's about 25 in physiology, um, 20, 19, sorry, in uh, pharmacology. So the pharmacology ones were first developed by the late Liz Davies and Paul White in Australia. It's then now moved on to an International Union of Pharmacology uh, project. Uh, the UK representatives are Claire Gilding and Steve Tucker from Newcastle and Aberdeen, uh, respectively and they've really been communicating with educators across the globe to to develop these and i've but this is the one i was particularly involved in so the core concept is drug targets so it comes with a definition the molecules the function of which can be modulated by a drug to produce a biological effect then there are sub concepts of that so a drug target can refer to a range of molecules such as receptors, design channels etc drug targets can be located intracellularly or extracellularly. The American Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology has again defined its core concepts, but they split them into foundational concepts, critical understanding of the discipline, so metabolism, structure and function, information storage and transfer, etc., and threshold concepts that when you understand these, it really sort of transforms your understanding of the discipline. So steady state biochemical pathways physical basis of interactions, et cetera. So the way you use these, you use selected example content to illustrate concepts. You, you can revisit uh, concepts or reintroduce concepts at a later date, but once you've explained the concept and they've understand it, you don't have to re-explain it. You just say, this is another example of, so, of, of this concept. So it's a type of demodulization. You can build on complexity as you re revisit, as you go through you know, the, the program. By reducing the number of examples and, and reiterations, you're rationalizing your content. You can also think about appropriate examples. So when you look at your different examples at different levels, have you really sort of included ones that are you know, inclusive, ones that you know, hit the education and sustainable development, decolonization uh, agendas, et cetera. And core concepts have been shown to promote, using core concepts rather than curriculum development, you know, driven curriculum have been shown to promote understanding. 
So this was the equip study. This was looking at why F1 doctors you know, had significant number of prescribing errors. So it was a GMC commission study. And one of the key findings of that uh, review was that knowledge was lacking, was complex contextual type of knowledge more than the underpinning theory or type of declarative knowledge commonly taught in undergraduate programs. So really, they were being given content overload rather than the underlying concepts. And so this, the inference from this is we should be teaching concepts rather than content. COVID also gave us the opportunity to rethink practical delivery. Um, you know, so really sort of the development of what I would call the practical plus. So I'm not a fan of, you know, three hour recipe driven practicals or standalone skills units. You know, students come into those practicals unprepared, they spend half the time working out what to do, they get limited data from it, etc. My real sort of emphasis is using content or activities to develop skills in both those two scenarios. So with the limited access or no access to um, labs during the pandemic, we became really you know, creative in how we enable them to get this practical experience. So home kits, instructional podcasts, GoPros, you know, dry lab science, spark worksheets, large data sets, etc. What it did enable us to do was to shift the learning, the so-called practical plus, so that there was a lot of pre-learning before they actually got in onto to these. Um, and again, the, you know, and then so most learners, as I said, occurred before they actually got onto to the practical experience. And this really sort of started you know before covid but during covid we really did um take you know take this forward so there's a spiral development of skills and attributes and the opportunity to bring in more authentic skills and fo attribute focus assessments so how did this look uh, in practice and this is the way that we did it at leeds in school of biomedical sciences experimental design focused mini projects so introduction to the activity of a case study or problem then there was a group development of the research question or hypothesis and the creation of a submission experiment design they then test that you know test that hypothesis using simulations apps data sets data mining etc could then uh, retest the hypothesis new experiment design more feedback and approval of it and then retested it again ending up in a, a plenary wrap-up session Going forward, you know, now we've got access back to the labs again. We can either, you know, not use simulations or these tools and just go straight to the, to the lab session after they've done experimental design, or we could do a hybrid approach. The first iteration is simulations, data sets, etc. Um, reconstitute the experimental design, or and then have another live lab session. So again, by the time we get at the lab, they know exactly what they're doing. This is a level five pharmacology example uh, designed by John, Dan and Stee, um, looking at structural activity relationships and the efficacy of different structures, uh, you know, of, of, you know, modified adrenaline structures. So they set the problem, they're given a toolkit, a virtual toolkit of, you know, cell cultures, um, et cetera, um, structural design tools, they design their study it's reviewed by their peers and then by the tutor um, they have a workshop on it they're given uh, an additional toolkit so how to analyze data um, use of prism pymol extractor and then they analyze the data and write up their uh, individual report and again as you can see this is lasting over a, an eight or nine week period so What's the sort of the learning experience, the outcomes, the impact of uh, this uh, type of approach? If we say purely online, then they lack the experiential learning of technical skills, the pipetting, et cetera. If we go for the hybrid model, then they gain those skills in the second part when they go into, into the lab itself to do the lab work. They do also gain um, additional skills and attributes they wouldn't have got from a traditional three-hour lab practical. So experimental design, hypothesis testing, 
hand, data handling and analysis of large data sets. The use of research tools and approaches, so discovering information, literature searching, uh, Excel, etc. Creative problem solving, critical thinking, resilience, and understanding that science doesn't work most of the time, critical for when they go onto the projects or find your careers. And team working and the skills that you only get through team working, communication, negotiation, etc. So does it work? This is a systematic review by Julia Cote from Australia, looking at uh, virtual practicals and whether they uh, supported conceptual learning, different types from virtual versus in-person, virtual versus blended, virtual uh, versus advanced uh, labs, etc. And for the majority of uh, different formats, then yes, it did, the virtual labs did support conceptual learning. So clear message that going forward, we should retain at least elements uh, of these. So is virtual labs engage the students, support learning, enables a spiral development of experimental research and transferable skills, gives students greater ownership and responsibility for their education experience. It is resource efficient because we are reducing lab time, and also we can build in other efficiencies. So there are colleagues that I know in Dundee and Newcastle who actually get students to submit to the technicians before they go in, their request for buffers, etc. cetera. Um, they have to sort of, and they have a budget they can actually work to or have to work to. If we're going down this thing, uh, this pathway, then really we have to, if we're asked about you know, how much lab time students are getting, we really have to package the two together, the pre-learning and the actual physical you know, in-person uh, activities. And when you explain this to, you know, to parents, to students, etc., they do get it. They, don't, they then lose the, the notion of, you know, I've got to be in the lab X number of hours, etc. So thinking about personalization of the personal and professional learning journey, there, there is limited engagement with personal and professional uh, or skills modules that you know, students have different interests and expectations, one size doesn't fit all. What we need to do through these as well is to give them greater ownership and responsibility for the learning, to instill on, in them the, the concept of lifelong learning, that we are go learning throughout or need to learn throughout our careers. And the way you know, we plan to do this uh, in our own school is to have many projects that run through uh, level four and level five, focused on you know, social justice, education, and sustainable development. So in the first year, they'll be looking at a, you know, applying the knowledge and creating solutions to a local issue. In the second year, it will be to a global grand challenge. So really we're empowering learners to bring their prior lived experience into it so it's inclusive. We're going to have additional support with it. So there might be stats lectures, there might be um, scientific, you know, literature searching things, all the things that they need to do it. And again, the model that are, you know, we've adopted for our level six skills module, there'll be some compulsory elements and there'll be some optional elements they can buy into if they think they need to, you know, to do that to, to, to engage with their project. So a spiral development of skills and attributes, and again, the opportunity for authentic skills and attribute focused assessments. So I think if you think about skills modules, personal and professional development modules, we really need to think outside of the box, go beyond what we've been doing previously, both in approach, assessment, and the outcomes that we expect uh, from it. That moves us on to rethinking assessments. If you look at the, the new benchmark statements, they're very much on work-based tasks and assessments and employability and graduate outcomes. Best practice in curriculum design is if we devise our learning outcomes, think how we're going to assess those learning outcomes, and then the pedagogical strategies to deliver the learning outcomes. We need to really think about the biosciences and the nature of knowledge creation in our different disciplines. So if you think, this is a paper by Yeo, Yeo and Bowman, and they've assigned the different disciplines into four groups, hard pure, hard applied, soft pure, soft applied. Biosciences were hard pure. Knowledge 
in the biosciences grows like a tree. We build on previous knowledge. And therefore, our assessments are linked to that. They're quantitative, object-driven, exams, lab reports, etc. Medicine, engineering, hard applied, very much problem solving, trial and error approaches. So their assessments are applying knowledge and problem solving. Social sciences, soft, pure, the way knowledge develops in those disciplines is that you um, traverse ground by you know, covered by others by providing new insights to, you know, to, to, to that knowledge. So they're using writing tasks, reflections, very creative types of um, assessments. So we really should be you know, thinking about our different uh, educational interventions, how we're going to best assess those learning outcomes, taking approaches from different disciplines, taking assessment criteria and tools from them um, and not reinventing the wheel. So we think about uh, the COVID experience and a shift towards real world tasks and assessments. This is really sort of highlighted by the work of Kay Sambal and Sally Brown. And they've got a whole website on a whole load of resources on Sally Brown's website in the link at the bottom on uh, assessments that were used that were created during COVID. We really were creative in, in what we did. And, and Dave Smith from David Smith from Sheffield Hallam has also got a sort of bioscience focused uh, collection as well. So you think not only were we creative in uh, the assessment tools that we used to, you know, to deliver assessments online, but also the student outputs massively in, uh, increased the sort of the complexity, creativity, the understanding. I, you know, you really were impressed by some of the sort of the essays that produced. Yes, there were issues with plagiarism that we have to resolve. Going forward, the Office for Students is concerned about grade inflation and anybody who has significant grade inflation has to justify uh, their uh, why the marks have increased so i think there is an institutional wide knee-jerk reaction to this to move towards you know back to the old exam um style approach but in a much shorter time period you know three hours but we, you know dave smith has done dave smith's done some really good work to show that you can't give exactly the same, same time period. Student can't complete a digital assessment. They don't have the typing speed, et cetera, in the same time period that we gave it, you know, than when they were writing it, you know, as a handwritten activity. So I think really we shouldn't be going back to our old forms of assessments. We should be think using the ones that we actually developed during COVID and modifying them so they're not Googleable or sort of, you know, or can be plagiarized, et cetera. So it's really thinking about the purpose of assessment. And you know, we're assessing you know, within programmes to see whether they have super knowledge, understanding and attainment to go to the next level. And then at the end, classification. What GPA do they come out with? I'm external at Bristol and they really, you know, their whole ethos, you know, external for medicine at Bristol, and their whole ethos is to develop people, not uh, you know, knowledge, or they did develop much, but you know, the primary ethos is developing people. So they've totally changed their assessments. It's formative assessments all the way through, but reflections, um, seminars, you know, sorry, scientific conferences where they're doing purchase future presentations, an art form, a scientific poster, things that develop these sort of personal skills rather than sort of assessing knowledge. What I think we need to do is to move to learning through assessment rather than assessing learning. So a move, as, as we're doing in our school and elsewhere at Leeds, to more synoptic assessments, but reflective assessments. We're giving students choice and ownership of their assessment tools, but also, you know, and building on that. And you can see that as they go through, you know, they're going to develop this balanced, authentic, uh, assessment portfolio that they can give to show you know to employers as a showcase of their learning which shows how they've progressed in knowledge skills and understanding throughout uh, their, their degree program far more useful than a um, a grade point average and doing it this way it's it's inclusive so just a an example of this so research focused authentic assessment so i've got a but developing animal models in drug development, uh, master's module, learning outcomes are to call the ethical issues, like the animal welfare factors, and design a uh, ethical approval for it. And so we're using the, the third learning outcome 
as a the assessment tool. So what the you know use this approach when I've uh, delivered courses in Africa where weeks course in animal experimentation we bring it together by discussing an ethics application. So team-based uh, project license application um, and the Animal Scientific Procedures Act they're going to have to design a protocol that looks at the safe efficacy and safety of a natural product it's going to be a, a plant derived you know an african plant so it's not going to be google um, they're going to decide what knowledge they're, they're going to have to need from that from the podcast that i'm going to provide them with um, and prepare them for it there's going to be a formative uh, application workshop so not only are you know using this as, as, as a, a real world uh, approval uh, sorry uh, assessment but also it's going to give them experience of rectory and prescribed writing that's going to help them in other similar sorts of careers. So the final thing then is preparation for the workplace, undergraduate or M-level projects. Think about uh, career destinations. Um, judge our students are not going to careers in research and therefore we need to better prepare them for these their, this you know, diversity of careers through their final year projects, both in tasks and activities. So, you know, fourth industrial revolution skills and attributes, real world work experience, social justice opportunities, really creating the global graduate. So rethinking the purpose, practices and outcomes of the capstone project, or sorry, of, of the project. So a shift toward capstone projects, culminating experience, which brings together knowledge, understanding and skills gained in early years, applying it to a problem which can be researched doesn't have to be and developing new knowledge and skills and creating a solution or output to that problem so the focus is personal and professional development and not research experience so over the years i've you know myself and colleagues at least developed this portfolio of opportunities so additional research projects for those in careers in research science and industry development capstones for those that are going into scientific careers outside of research and social justice capstones for those that are uh, want to use a science in in the community by having this portfolio of opportunities is inclusive there's something for every student we've just done some data analysis to show that there is you know learning gain across all different formats different communities etc is exactly the same so students choose their capstone based on their individual needs or um, career intentions and to go with it, we've got real world assessments and giving students the choice of assessment. So academic paper, e-portfolio, grant proposal, et cetera. How does that fit into the uh, institutional sector alignment? We are a research intensive unit institution, expectation of research-based learning, but the activities we've chosen are researched somewhere in the university, if not the biosciences. Pre-COVID, a number of colleagues were across the UK were introducing these different interventions, but they're really seen as research projects. So if you look at uh, Martin Luck's book at the top or McHealy's uh, case studies book here, again, there was talking about um, you know, research projects rather than capstones. Printing bodies are starting to, to catch on to this. So the Society of Biology now has, you know, the language of change is now a capstone project and a wide diversity of opportunities. It's the opportunity to bring in the QAA, things of education, sustainable development, EGI, um, inclusivity, et cetera. Um, Leeds, we're going through a, a program curriculum change. And, you know, we it used to be a requirement that everybody had to do a research project across the institution. They recognize the benefits of a um, capstone and the language is now a capstone and i have a, a fellowship to work with colleagues across the university to implement capstones or support them in implementing capstones across their programs so briefly then we're, we're capitalizing on lived experiences so really moving on to more social justice projects where students are working with the community ngos um even uh you know, transnational education opportunities, so grand challenges projects working with students in Africa. We've shifted to capstone briefs, so this is where they, the team has a task rather than defined project, and again, it's up to them how they address that task and the approaches they use to do it. Benefit of this is that we can up or down 
you know, our expectations depending on how students are getting on. Look at capstones across the world, and only in the UK we're quite conservative. I think what we really need to do is broaden our portfolio of experiences, and there's really no limits to, to what we can achieve if we really want to fully realise the transformative and translational potential of capstones globally. Just looking forward, I've covered some things but not everything. I think we really are at the start of an inspirational global educational journey that we need to sort of move to a data-driven personalization of learning journey experiences so not using ai not really as we are at the moment to look at engagement but looking at how we can better support students to more personalize their journey but also for ourselves without you know to rationalize our teaching time focusing in, you know on things that students are struggling with rather than, than everything more flexible learning uh, approaches so hybrid, high flex, digital enabled, et cetera, and giving students choice of opportunity. More focus on social justice experiences that they're working with or for the community. Co-creation and, and partnership learning communities, you know, across, you know, with all stakeholders and more transnational educational opportunities. So not, you know, bringing students over here from elsewhere, but actually our students working digitally uh, with students uh, elsewhere, particularly in the global south. So bringing it all together then, I, I see going forward the next five to ten years as a, a once in the career educational opportunity that really as educators we should seize to create high, and really lead on the creation of high quality inspirational experiences. It is going to require active education input and ownership at all levels and with all stakeholders. So telling you know, our senior leadership etc um, what works and what doesn't work, embedding in it our own personal philosophies. Essential that we have collaborative partnerships both across our institutions but also externally with all stakeholders. If we are going for digitally enabled, then we really have to design for that that is going to be a totally different experience. We can't just digitize current content. And that we have to manage the expectations of all stakeholders and you know produce the evidence to show that why we're using this approach and the benefits of, of using these approaches. And then I think we will fully realise the transformative and translation potential of HE and make UK HE internationally sector leading. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dave. Uh, thanks for an excellent talk. Um, so as we mentioned at the start of the webinar, um, just to give you some information on the award, Dave's the recipient of our 2022 Teaching Excellence Award. Um, we first presented this award uh, in 2018 and we award it annually um, and the recipient of this award is employed in higher education um, and demonstrates individual excellence, commitment to their own continuing professional development and commitment to students and colleagues. I think you could agree that Dave has shown all of those things and, and some of the examples in the talk today, so thanks Dave. Um, I'll talk a little more about our other awards uh, a bit later. Um, for now, we've got a few minutes for questions. Uh, I can see that some people have already put some questions in the chat, which is great. If you do have any other burning ones, stick them in. I'm not sure we can get through all of them, but we'll do our best in the few minutes that we have. Um, so Dave, I'm just gonna pick some of the questions from the, the chat now. So we've got one here. Uh, do you not run into trouble with over-assessing things? So the questioner asks, I've had this dilemma of providing varied and useful skills-based assessments while not pressuring students with too many jobs to do through the year. And uh, they also say that our uni has been a little contradictory in what they wanted a few years ago and what they now want. And the first thing, or well, the last part first, I think institutions are changing. With us, we are moving very much to formative assessments and then a, a larger, single assessment at the end so really using our project-based approach then actually we are rationalizing our assessments and really using it you know as i said assessment for learning as, as formative we go through and then the endpoint assessment um, our plan is to move towards synoptic assessments so we're building up a portfolio of assessments so yes we are uh actually massively decreasing our assessments and you know with intention but also making Think about each assessment um, and making sure that it's the right one for the right task, you know, for like you know, learning outcomes, etc. Thanks for that. 
Um, I'll pick another question. Um, so uh, you talked about, about collaborative learning. So with collaborative learning, how do you manage the variable abilities within a group? I'm thinking in terms of assessment individually and ensuring a beneficial process for all, not just uplifting certain students while not maybe pushing the very good students. We, I don't think we, you know, we're discriminating at the bottom end. We're not, you know, that I think the critical to it is to actually get the teams to work together and to, you know, each one will have different skills and expertise and get the, you know, them to contribute their, you know, where they can work to it best. Um, and really, I, I, you know, think about where we have team-based learning, you know, in saying our in our projects, then the final output is is the only thing that's individual. That it's team ownership of you know design, execution, data, etc. And so they the final output becomes the discriminator. That you know they can all buy into it. Uh, you know you know and, and equally contribute uh, to it. And I think doing a team based approach actually. You know they don't want to let their you know particularly if they're working the same team throughout they don't want to let you know their their fellow team members down so it does actually encourage and inspire uh those that might sit back as individuals um to, to come forward thanks um I've got another question here and i think this one might be familiar to quite a few people um, my department has substantial has had substantial issues with attendance since resuming in-person teaching sessions. Do you have any advice on helping students understand that turning up is for their benefit? We have exactly the same problem, and and that is attendance both at digital sessions and in person, and you know even sort of practicals. So the way we've tackled it is to reiterate at. Um, you know, at the beginning of the year, that you know, first year it's facilitated, saying autonomous, second year, autonomous at the end, and really that we're preparing them from the workplace right from the start. But also that if they want to get anything out of the workshops, they've got to have done the pre-work, and that the workshops are not recorded. So if they don't attend the workshop, they miss out on the learning so it's you know it's in it's in their best interest to to participate throughout thanks and i guess a related note to that we've got a question um that kind of stems from what you just said really like how, how do you ensure students do all the activities outside of the live teaching sessions it's a real challenge so that there are tasks within associated with it so if i take my skills module at uh, level six it's two week units a week and a half of pre-work and then a bring it together plenary at the end there are tasks for the teams to do they will have to create some form of output so you can monitor engagement um you know th uh, through that and that you know again emphasize as, as said a minute ago that if they haven't done those tasks which are actually going to sort of you know evaluate that you know and give feedback on 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 the, on the tasks or the outputs then it's pointless turning up for the workshop thanks um i think this is quite a mean question but i really want to ask it because i also want to know the answer um someone's asked uh, great talk dave do you have any idea how many institutions across the uk will take a different approach to teaching after covid anecdotal so Ours, even before COVID, we had a new VC who said that the um, online lecture, sorry, the face-to-face -face lecture was dead. We had to move to active learning in the in, in what was lecture times. That's been moderated slightly to digitally enabled uh, you know, as OFS and Michelle Donlin have uh, changed. Um, if you look at the appointments, so, you know, there's a lot of senior appointments across the sector. I'm not going to name names or institutions where they've actually brought in digital champions to, to, to move that way. Um, and, I, you know, the point I made earlier that, you know, a lot of institutions had to invest significantly in digital resources during COVID. You know, that is that um, 
resource is going to be wasted if they don't actually use it going forward. And I think, you know, there's a growing body of evidence now of the, of the benefit, you know, I presented some today of the benefits of the, the hybrid approach. And I think, you know, and also, you know, as I said, student expectations that they're expect, you know, they have flexibility of learning now. If we don't offer them at least some content, you know, and, and activities developed, you know, you know, provided digitally, then they, you know, we're going to have that problem we just talked about a minute ago of no shows, as they have jobs and other things, you know, and they've got used to this flexible learning. Thanks. That's interesting. Um, I think we, we'll, we'll bring the questions to a closer. So I know we didn't get through all the ones that people typed in, um, but sorry that we ran out of, out of time for the questions. I just have a few things to say before we uh, finish the session. Firstly, just thanks to Dave for the excellent talk and thanks to all of the audience for attending. Hopefully you found it interesting. Um, if you want to, you can continue the conversation online on Twitter. So you can follow at BiochemSoc if you're not already and uh, PP Publishing, which is our Portland Press uh, site. Um, as I said earlier, we, we really welcome suggestions for future topics. If you've got a burning idea that you'd like to suggest for a future webinar, um, you can submit a proposal and the, the website to do that with all the information of our webinars is on screen now. Um, and you can find out more information about webinars there. So bicomstreet.org slash webinars. Um, have a look at the website. Uh, it will list our future webinars. Um, we've also done over 40 webinars uh, before this one today. So if you've missed any of them or you want to re-watch any of them, um, you can visit our website or our YouTube channel where you can watch our previous webinars as well. Um, and the recording from today's webinar will also be up there in the next couple of weeks. So if you'd like to revisit it or share with colleagues, um, then you can do that on our website. Um, just a note on our awards. So obviously this is our Education Excellence Award, but we have a whole range of awards recognising different things. And our 2024 awards are now open for nominations. We've significantly streamlined the nominations process. So for anyone that's done it in the past, you'll find it uh, a lot more straightforward and streamlined. So now is the ideal time to nominate someone if you have an outstanding peer or colleague who you think deserves recognition. The deadline for the initial nomination, so the first part of the process is the 1st of November. And for our, all of our awards, we welcome submissions by and for both members and non-members of the society. Um, finally, I'd just like to highlight that really we think it's more important than ever now to stay connected and engage with your fellow molecular bioscientists. If you're interested too, it, we think it's a very exciting time to join the Biochemical Society. We've got a community of researchers and specialists. Um, you can stay connected, take advantage of all our key benefits. So things like uh, discounted registration fees for our society courses and meetings, um, access to a load of grants and bursaries, um, personal online access to a couple of our journals and plenty more. So if you're interested in becoming a member, if you're not already, please visit our website bicomputer.org slash membership. Um, personally, from my point of view, I've learned a great deal through engaging with the society's education activities um, and have met many excellent colleagues along the way. So I thoroughly recommend getting involved if you haven't done already. Um, so that's all from me. Thanks again for today for your talk. Thanks all for attending uh, and goodbye.